Bachelor, everyone, greetings. Thank you for joining me for another blessed Shabbat. For this lesson, we'll be going over part four of the power of atonement. All right. So we're going to start with Leviticus chapter 23, Leviticus chapter 23, verse 26 through 32. And it reads, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Also, on the tenth day of the seventh month there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be in holy convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls, and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And ye shall do no work in that same day, for it is a day of atonement to make an atonement for, for you before the Lord your God. For whatsoever soul it shall be that shall not be afflicted, in that same day he shall be cut off from among his people. And whatsoever soul it be that doeth any work in that same day, the same soul will I destroy from among his people. He shall do no manner of work it shall be a statue forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest, and ye shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month at even, from even unto even, shall ye celebrate your Sabbath. All right, brothers and sisters, so we see here the Most High is emphasizing the ninth day into of the seventh month, the ninth day at Eve to the 10th day of Eve. Okay, that would be a complete 24 hours. All right, notice what most said. It is a holy convocation. All right, so I'm going to break down the words for everyone. We understand what? That holy convocation means it is a time of public meeting or an assembly. All right. You were, so pretty much you would say people were in a setting where they can do reading of the Bible or getting a lesson on the Day of Atonement. Okay, this was important to know what atonement was. Okay, so a holy convocation was done. We were to afflict our souls and make an offering made by fire unto the Most High. Now we understand that what? We understand that according to the Most High, sending his son our savior christ to die for our sins we no longer need to make an offering that offering or should i say we no need we know we do not need to make an offering by fire okay because christ was the perfect sacrifice but what we would do is go into Sirach or Ecclesiasticus 35 and 1, and we see what offerings are. And it reads, Sirach 35 and 1, he that keepeth the law bringeth offerings enough. He that taketh heed to the commandment offereth a peace offering. He that requiteth a good term offereth fine flour. And that means, you know, stopping bad habits, you know. 
uh, returning evil for evil, turning the other cheek if someone does something bad to you. Okay, that's what that means. And he that giveth alms sacrifices praise. To depart from wickedness is a pleasing thing to the Lord, and to forsake unrighteousness is a propitiation. Okay, so to depart and cut off your unrighteousness, you know, and work on yourself, that's also, and to evaluate yourself is also considered an offering to the Most High. Reads, thou shalt not appear empty before the Lord, for all these things are to be done because of the commandment. The offering of the righteous maketh the altar fat, and the sweet savor thereof is before the Most High. The sacrifice of a just man is acceptable, and the memorial thereof shall never be forgotten. Okay, so just want to show you that these are the offerings that we are now to give to the Most High. Why? Because Christ is the perfect sacrifice okay so what do we owe in return of christ uh being sent to die for our sins we owe fasting and we owe a proper offering of cutting off unrighteousness okay going back to leviticus chapter 23 all right so we understand the ninth day of Eve to the 10th day of Eve. We understand the offerings. We understand the holy convocation. Now, what does afflict mean? Let's go into this word and it says afflict your souls, okay? So afflict, and you can see it says to depress, but I want you to look at this word. It says to chasten self, okay? To chasten self. Look what it says, to deal hardly with, okay? Look at all these words, to humble self. Look at all this, right? So we see afflict is about bringing ourselves into submission to the Most High. Here you can also see it says submit self, okay? So at this point, brothers and sisters, and also says to weaken. So at this point, brothers and sisters, we see this is clearly a holy day to what? to really acknowledge our faults that we've committed, okay? To humble ourselves, to say, you know what? Most high, your mercy and your grace is good, but I don't deserve it. So therefore I'm gonna chasten myself. I'm gonna humble myself and fast, okay? It is a humbling thing. A lot of people don't even know the power of fasting. Now, remember, Christ told us what? You can get rid of certain evil entities without prayer and fasting. So the Most High implemented a day where you must fast so that you can get rid of those certain discrepancies, okay? So that means afflict. Now we're gonna look at atonement. All right, expiation. Expiation is what atonement means. And, you know, And it says, a religious act by which satisfaction or atonement is made for the commission of some crime, the guilt done away, and the obligation to punishment 
is canceled. Do you see what this means? So this day is a special day where we, what? We acknowledge the fault in which we've done. We humble ourselves in fasting and asking for forgiveness and the most high wipes away the obligation of punishment that was due for those sins. That's big. Everyone should know this, right? Give me the root word. The root word of, you see it says Kippur. Some people know it as Yom, which is day. The poor of atonement. Okay. The root word is to cover or so don't look at, you know, especially or condone, but to placate or cancel. Atonement means to cleanse, to forgive, to be merciful, to pardon to purge away, also to put off. So that's us putting off our sin by acknowledging it. And if the Most High feels that we are sincere, then he will put off the judgment as well, okay? So this was a big day, no work, serving the Most High, humbling ourselves, bringing ourselves down into submission and acknowledging our faults. All right, Exodus chapter 30. Exodus chapter 30, verse 10. And I read, And Aaron shall make an atonement upon the horns of it once in a year with the blood of the sin offering of atonement once in a year once in the year shall he make an atonement upon it throughout your generations it is most holy unto the lord so i want to wanted to bring some out some of the old scriptures out of the old covenant because i wanted you to understand that atonement was what it was for sin offering okay so you can say fasting is a what a sin offering right fasting and humbling yourself is a sin offering how many people do this it's very important. We can also see that what? We can see the correlation of how it was moved from the old covenant to the new covenant of Christ. Because what? Because it said, Aaron shall make an atonement upon the horns of it once in a year with the blood of the sin offering. Now, whose blood replaces the ram and, 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 and the horns? It's Christ's blood. So now it is with the blood of Christ of the sin offering. He is our sin offering to the Most High. Yet he did nothing wrong. He is the perfect lamb for our sin offering. Okay, moving forward, Leviticus chapter 16, Leviticus chapter 16, verse 30, and I read, for on that day shall the priests make an atonement for you to cleanse you that ye may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. 
I'm going to read verse 31. It shall be a Sabbath of rest unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls by a statue for ever. Okay, so this was chapter 16. I want you to understand it's also about atonement. Okay, many people may not realize that, but it is. Okay, I'll read. In fact, what I'll do is I'll start from verse 29 and show you. Verse 29 says, And this shall be a a statue forever unto you that in the seventh month on the tenth day of the month ye shall afflict your souls and do no work at all whether it be one of your own country or a stranger that sojourneth among you for on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you that ye may be clean from all your sins before the lord it shall be a Sabbath of rest unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls by a statue forever. So we see that this was supposed to be a very big day. Now, also, I want to share that you had to understand that this the priest had a very extremely important and trust trusting job because one how could they make a sin offering to the most high if they didn't know your sin <laughs> you see that they had to know therefore they could pray for the person and ask the Most High for the acceptance of their atonement to cleanse them and clean them from all their sins. Notice this was an atonement, not for one sin, not for two sin, but what does it say? That ye may be clean from all your sins. Okay, so think of it as a as a day in the year where the Most High is going to bless us if we're humble in our fasting, okay, and cleanse us of our sins, a day of mercy, love, and forgiveness through affliction of our soul. Leviticus chapter 6, verse 1 through 7. Leviticus chapter 6, verse 1 through 7 reads, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, If a soul sin and commit a trespass against the Lord, and lie unto his neighbor in that which was delivered him to keep, or in fellowship, or in, in, in a thing taken away by violence, or have deceived his neighbor, or have found that which was lost, and lies concerning it, and sweareth falsely, and any of all these, that a man doeth sinning therein. There it shall be, because he hath sinned and is guilty, that he shall restore that which he took violently away, or the thing which he hath decent, deceitfully dotted, or that which was delivered him to keep, or the lost thing which he found. or all that about which he hath sworn falsely, he shall even restore it in the principle and shall add the fifth part more thereto and give it unto him to whom it appertaineth in the day of his trespass offering. And he shall bring his trespass offering unto the Lord, a ram without a, ble a blemish out of the flock with thy estimation for a trespass offering unto the priest, and the priest shall make an atonement for him before the Lord, and it shall be forgiven for him anything of all that he hath done in trespassing therein. So now 
we see also what? We see atonement was also used for trespassing, taking, harming, doing all kinds of sins. I use this as an example. All kinds of sins that even uh, affected other brothers and sisters, okay? Not to do it again, by the way, all right? So you don't, you know, do something and then wait for the Day of Atonement and do it again. All right. Job chapter 33. Job chapter 33, verse 14. Job chapter 33, verse 14. For God speaketh once. Yea, twice, yet man perceiveth it not. And this is to me, this was was very important. Because though the most high makes it very clear to us, sometimes he gives you messages. Sometimes you'll be like, oh, what does that mean? Or most high give me deeper meaning. Uh the most high speak at once. But because, you know. Our minds are not focused on signs of the Most High to connect with Him. He gonna give it to you twice. All right. It says, "In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon men, and slumberings upon the bed, then He openeth the ears of men and sealeth their instruction, that He may withdraw man from his purpose and hide pride." For man, he keepeth back his soul from the pit and his life from perishing by this wood. He chastened also, he is chastened also with pain upon his bed and the multitude of his bones with strong pain. So that his life affordeth bread and his soul dainty meat. His flesh is consumed away that it cannot be seen his bones that were not seen stick out. Yea, his soul draw near unto the grave and his life to the destroyers. If there be a messenger with him, an interpreter, one among a thousand, to show unto man his uprightness, then he is gracious unto him and saith, deliver him from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom. His flesh shall be freshener, fresher than a child's. He shall return to the days of his youth. He shall pray unto God, and he will be favorable unto him, and he shall see his face with joy, for he will render unto man his righteousness. He looketh upon men, and if any say, I have sinned and, I, and perverted that which was right, and it profited me not, he will deliver his soul from going into the pit, and his life shall see the light. Lo, all these things worketh God oftentimes with man, to bring back his soul from the pit, to be enlightened with the light of the living. So why did I bring this here, right? This is referring to fasting. So in verse 20, you see, so that his life abhorreth bread and his soul dainty meat. So for this time, what? He's fasting. Okay. One thing I loved about this is that it says, for the most high speaketh once. So the day of atonement is not only for you to be in humbleness, but when we go to sleep, and even though you may not have a dream, what does the Most High do? It says, he opens up the ears of men and sealeth instruction. So then you may say, oh, the day before I told me, oh, you know, I'm struggling. Maybe I don't know what to, what to fast for. The Most High is going to place it on your heart. And he's going to seal instruction. At the same time, what does that do? 
it counters what Satan wants, which is our purpose and the pride of man. So it says in verse 17 that he, meaning the Most High, may withdraw man from his purpose and hide pride from man. So you could sit there and, and hide that pride, the Most High will hide it. And on that day specifically, especially because you don't need to be saying, oh, well, I can't really think of sin. That's pride as well, okay? Because everyone has some faults, all right? Verse 18, it says, he keepeth back his soul from the pit in his life from perishing by the sword. So this is a fasting at what? It is merciful from the most high that keepeth our soul from the pit and from us perishing from destruction, all right? Now, notice, I don't know if anyone noticed, but sometimes when you're on the Day of Atonement, you, your body aches. Maybe your bones may, may have some pain. Maybe you get a lot of knee pains, right, or joint pains. Okay, it says, he chastened also with pain upon his bed, and the multitude of his bones was strong pain. Why? Because... So that his life of poor bread and dainty meats, right? It says his flesh is consumed away that it cannot be seen, All right? And what, what does it mean when our, our flesh cannot be seen? It's the inside man that the flesh is being consumed. It's being destroyed, right? Now, it says in verse 24, then he is gracious unto him, saith, deliver him from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom. And what is that ransom? That ransom is in place of the sin. So the Most High made it to where that man, if he wanted to come back to the Most High, or if he made mistakes in the year, he can use the Day of Atonement as a offering of sin, a peace offering, and say, Most High, forgive me, a trespass offering, okay, and say, Most High, this is our ransom, please forgive me for my sins. It says what? On the Day of Atonement, his flesh, or after, his flesh shall be fresher than a child, she shall return to the days of his youth. And we know that at the end of a fast, you end up being stronger. And fasting has many health benefits, not only spiritual as well. Okay. It reads, he shall pray unto God, and he shall be favorable unto him, and he shall see his face with joy, for he will render unto man his righteousness. So once the Most High sees that we are humble and asking for forgiveness, what happens? The Most High restores that favor upon us and will render or repay or recompense us for the righteousness that we have done. Okay. And look what the Most High is saying here. He looketh upon men. If and, and, and if any say, I have sinned and perverted that which was right, and it profited me not. He will deliver his soul from going into the pit, and his life shall see the light. So this, this whole scripture right here, these two, 27 and 28, is exactly what the Day of Atonement is about. Acknowledging your faults and saying that the sin that you did at the time, it was for you entirely, your flesh, and it profited you not so the most high is looking for humbleness of acknowledgement okay that's what he's looking for all right it says all these things 
low. All these things work at the most high oftentimes with man. This means this is the most highest process of fasting. Okay, to what? To bring his soul, to bring back his soul from the pit, to be enlightened with the light of the living. Okay, what a blessing, isn't it? All right, Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel chapter 18. You know, 18 verse 27 to 30. Ezekiel chapter 18, 27 to 30. And it reads, Again, when the wicked man turneth away from his wickedness that he hath committed, and doeth that which is lawful and right, he shall save his soul alive, because he considereth and turneth away from all his transgressions that he hath committed. He surely, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Yet, saith the house of Israel, the way of the Lord is not equal. O house of Israel, are not my ways equal? Are not your ways unequal? Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, and everyone according to his ways, saith the Lord God. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. All right. So here we're seeing this is an overall promise to everyone that if you turneth away from wickedness, the Most High will be pleased and spare your life. But if not, the Most High will have your life, okay? So understand, all right? Now, the Most High also in to specifically talk to the children of Israel scattered across the world. So what does this mean? Children of Israel look at the Most High's ways as burdensome. How can I say this? The Most High says that the children of Israel look at the Most High's ways and say they are not equal. Okay, so that means they look at his ways as burdensome. But we, as the Most High's people, must recognize that without his ways, our ways are burdensome. Look how many times people go out into the world and do everything they want on their own. Only to cry and say, God, why didn't you help me? Well, he's not going to help you in your sin. And then they want to blame the most high because they want to say, well, that's not what I wanted to do. Ecclesiastes 12 tells us the whole duty of man is to serve the most high and to fear him. It has nothing to do with our personal preference of what we want to do, all right? So we must what? Acknowledge our wickedness, use the day of atonement to acknowledge from wickedness, turn ourselves around and tell the most high we're sorry for our sins. Acts chapter three. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. And I read, Repent, ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And I had to include this because I thought it was I thought it was direct correlation to our special day, the special holy day of atonement. The whole point is to repent and convert that our sins may be blotted out. Now, let me get this word for you, converted, okay? Now, I know when people think of the word converted, they think of those who are new, to the truth, right? But converted means to return again, okay? 
to come again to. All right. So sin draws us or sin draws a gap between us and the most high. Then we can so we can say this as we continue in sin, we grow far apart from the most high. Therefore, we are not drawing nigh unto him. Therefore, if we are in sin and we're and we are distancing ourselves from the most high, what does this mean? We are not cleaving to the most high. We are not drawing nigh to him, which means we cannot resist the devil, which means that gap then becomes our greatest enemy because we are now drawing nigh to Satan because we continue in sin. Okay, so you're either going to pull to the one side or you're going to pull to the other. Christ told us you're either going to serve one master or you're going to serve the other and hate the other, right? So if you're going to live in sin, you're going to hate the most high. If you're going to live in righteousness, you're going to hate Satan. And that's what the most high tells us. Love good and hate evil. Okay. So we must turn again. We must use this day of atonement to convert our souls again. Okay. From any wrongdoing that we've done so that the most high may blot out our sins. And then you see, it says, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Yes, what does that mean? Because Christ died for our sins. And so comes a what? A quickening of the spirit, a refreshness of the spirit, a rejuvenation. You say, all right, oh, praise the most high. I was dealing with this flesh issue. I was dealing with this sin. All right, now I can. I, I, day of atonement's coming. I'm going to prepare myself humbly. When it comes, we're going to fast, we're going to pray, we're going to acknowledge, and then we're going to move forward with freshness to start because the most high doesn't want me to dwell on negativity. And notice how serious this day is, right? The most high created a day where you can acknowledge your sin so that Satan doesn't have to bring it back up over and over and over again, right? Because if, this, if there was not a time for offering of sins, also known as our day of atonement, what would happen? Satan would continue to accuse you of all the things that would rack up and sin, right? Oh, you've done this. You've done this. You've done this. What about this year? What about this year? What about that year? What about that year? So anyone who's bringing up sins from the past is being used as a vessel from Satan when the Most High has clearly given you what? A day of atonement. Okay. If the Most High has given us a day of atonement, or humbling and chastening and afflicting our soul. That means anyone who brings up the past sins when the Most High has already forgiven you is an agent or is being used by Satan. I was going to say agent of Satan or is being used by Satan. Okay. Big, it's very crucial you understand that. I don't care if they're your mama, your your daddy, your cousin, your coworker, your your best friend, your your husband, your your wife. The Most High has power over forgiveness. Therefore, we should not be hanging people's faults over their head. Does that make sense? Okay. Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11, verse 14 through 18. It reads, but Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning and expounded it by order unto them, saying, 
excuse me, that was verse 4. I apologize. Acts 11, verse 14 to 18. Who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved? And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as one as on us at the beginning. Then I remembered, then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us, who believed on the Lord Yeshua Christ. Yeshua Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. So I'm sorry that this may hurt a few people who believe that Gentiles can't get into the kingdom. We don't care. Um, so we understand that this day also is for Gentiles to partake, to ask for forgiveness and repentance, all right? Because repentance was also granted to them. We also read in the Old Testament, it said what? That strangers, that sojourner, a stranger is a Gentile, one that is not Israelite born, okay? So yes, Gentiles were to partake in repentance of life, which is the day of atonement. Okay, very important. Second Timothy chapter two, verse twenty through twenty six. And it reads, but in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. So I want you to break this down, right? I want to break this down with you. It says if we purge from ourselves. Now remember, afflict also meant to purge, right? So if we afflict, if we purge ourselves, let's let's see if they can tie in the correlation. Look. It means purge, to cleanse thoroughly. Okay, purge means to cleanse thoroughly. Isn't that what we do on the Day of Atonement? To cleanse our soul? Now, this action, I want to share this, brothers and sisters. This action should not only be done on the Day of Atonement. Okay, if you wait just for one day of the year, you're going to be falling into a lot of traps of Satan. Okay, we are to renew ourselves day by day. So this is a process. All right. But the whole point is to cleanse ourselves thoroughly so that we will be vessels because our body is a temple. We are vessels of the Holy Spirit. So we shall be vessels of honor, sanctified. What is sanctification or sanctified? Sanctified means to what? To make holy. So the Mutai wants to make us holy, okay? And be meat for the master's use. And what is meat for the master's use? It means easily 
used and useful, profitable for the Most High's will. Okay, there it is. Be for the master's use means to be easily used. I'm going to bring this up and bring it up again. It means to be easily used, which means useful or profitable. Okay. So we want the most high to look at us and say, I'm going to choose this, this sister. I'm going to choose this young lady or this woman. I'm going to choose this young man or this man. I'm going to choose them because I can see that using them will be profitable in this situation. Right? And it says, when you become easily used and useful for the master's use, he prepares you every good work. Okay? So he's going to use people. Verse 22, and I read, flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Now, why did it say, why did the Most High say, flee also youthful lust? Do you understand that our habits are created during our teenage years? So a lot of the discrepancies that we had in our teenage years, if we do not get rid of them, they will just transfer into adulthood. Understand that. So it's important that our, our, we have to understand this, right? A lot of people's greatest sins come as a teenager. That's when they become rebellious against parents. That's when they... When they want to do their own thing, they think that they know everything, right? And so all these circumstances from all these bad decisions are shaping the mindset of people throughout adolescency or the teenage years. And then because then they feel the world is against them. No one understands them. What happens? They take this mentality into adulthood because of those experiences that they induced on themselves. So we must work to what? Flee from all the desires that were once in our heart as teenagers, which is the most rebellious stage of life. Notice it, notice as a child, we're very innocent. All we do is play, eat, and sleep. Then when the teenage years come, people are consumed with what? They're consumed with friends. They're consumed with image. They're consumed with a parent. They're consumed with the flesh and desire to be with people as if they know exactly what it means to have a family, which obviously we know teenagers don't. They just commit the actions. This is why we have people today fighting for abortions because they want to fulfill the flesh but not live with the circumstances of the flesh, right? So we must what? We must flee those youthful desires, okay? And notice it says, follow righteousness, faith, peace, and charity. But it says, don't follow it unless you follow it with those who call on the Most High with a pure heart. So that means you also have to understand who is sincere in serving the Most High and who is not, okay? Verse 23 reads, but foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they gender strifes. And, and I have to bring this word out, strifes, okay? That they gender strifes. They gender controversy, battle, fighting, 
pay what? Argument, right? So you see dispute, right? So think of this way, right? If we're, we see all the signs of Christ, and someone, and, and, and this is no, maybe this will be disrespectful to some people, maybe it won't, but whatever. Um, you can't please everyone. So if we see all the signs of Christ, Matthew 24 is like, oof, it, it, it's, it's like, wow, right? And people start asking questions about the flat earth or is the earth flat? That's a foolish question at this time. I'm, I'm just going to be honest. It's even a foolish question to ask, like, all right, who wrote the Bible right now? If you are so consumed with the earth being circular or flat, heaven ain't for you. I'm just going to say that. Because, one, this world is getting destroyed. So if you're not conformed to... If you're conformed to this world and the things that people are throwing out there as bait to get you to be distracted and you're not conformed to the next world, which is the new heaven and new earth, you have missed the whole point of the entire Bible. It's foolish questions. Or about if, if you are a person waiting for an answer to know who wrote the Bible, yet you understand and you can see that people are correlating these prophecies that are happening today to this book, the Bible, you have missed the whole point. And any other questions like that? Like seriously, these are unlearned questions. These are foolish questions. And I, this is why when people ask me such stupid questions, I don't even say a word. I just say, I'm not going to answer that. A lot of times I just want to laugh at people when they say these things. Oh, who who wrote this book? Or or what's the validity of, of, of this uh, prophet? Or, forget it. Because one, I'm going to be honest, when people ask me stupid questions like, is the earth flat? I'm looking at them like, do you see the signs? Does it matter if the earth is flat? Because the earth being flat doesn't mean the world that Christ is coming back. It's the signs that mean Christ is coming back. And honestly, when people ask me this question, it does gender strife in my soul. It just gets me angry. Like, why are you asking me this? I say, Lord, most high, why are they asking me this question? Okay. <laughs> Verse 24, it says, and the servant of the Lord must not strive but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, and patient. Patient, And so people will use this in saying, a servant or a minister of the Lord must not strive. That's correct. You must not be angry or wanting to debate with other people. All right, same thing, to dispute, to debate. That's why I just avoid it altogether. I say, hey, if that's your particular thing that you want to be, you know, involved in, I'm not the minister for you. And some people will use this. Well, it says you have to be apt to teach. Apt to teach those to get into the kingdom. A flat earth is not going to get you into the kingdom. Okay. It's not. <laughs> it's not, okay? You know, the prophecies and understanding how to endure them, because Christ says, he who endures to the end, the same shall be saved. That is going to get you into the kingdom. Okay, that is going to get you another day of mercy to work off those sins that we've committed in our life. Not the flat earth. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves if god preventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth
look at what oppose means. Set oneself opposite. Okay. So if your spirit is wanting to do something proper and the Holy Spirit is trying to guide you, but then you have what? It says be disputatious. Okay. Disputatious means apt to cavil or controvert as disputations. Okay. Persons, person or temper. And so I'm going to look up cavil. To advance futile objections or to frame sophisms for sake of victory in an argument. So get, getting all the all the ring things, right? <laughs> all the things to to oppose what is righteous. Look what it says. To find fault without good reason. Those who those who so opposing themselves would find fault in themselves without a proper reasoning in scripture and bringing upon sin and, and doubt. So if Satan places a seed of doubt, they just start finding more faults without good reason. They can't even see they're good, okay? And then also, you know, Calvo refers to those, um, and it says about the striving as well. So they want to strive with the servants and of the Most High, and a servant is a minister, okay? They want to strive bringing faults out as well, okay? Of those things that they seek to argue about. Continuing in verse 26, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who have taken, who are taken captive by him at his will. And so to argue and to be cavil about what foolish and unlearned things. That is also being a part of captains of Satan's captivity because your focus on, is on the wrong things. Can you imagine Satan getting a kick out of people? You're getting a kick out of what people view as truth. It's almost comical. It's almost com like, like, for example, all right, I've never understand this, how there can be advocates for animal rights, but yet people treat humans so badly. What? That's called being captive to Satan's will. Yet you're, you're going to love one creation, you're going to go and hate another. These people are sick in the head. <laughs> that's sick in the head okay you got let's let's look at abortion right you got people who never want children but want to commit the continuous acts of making children and bearing children but yet when a child appears all they want to do is kill. These people are sick in the head. They are captive to Satan's will. Okay. Think about this. I'm going to take another shot. Okay. The people who call themselves followers of Christ, yet they're 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 fighting against political parties, Democrat versus Republican, Republican versus Democrat. And this is just in Babylon alone, but we know this is everywhere in the world. People will fight over a political party, yet neither of those political parties is what, for, is what Christ stood for. But yet you're going to fight over it. Maybe. Just maybe if people followed Christ, there would be no political parties. Because you put down 
the blue, you'd put down the red, you put down this color or that color, this person or that person and say, my representative is Christ. And because you hated him once, I know that you will always hate him. Therefore, the, my vote and this, it doesn't even matter. Because guess what? I didn't have to vote for Christ to represent me. Christ came willingly to represent me, whether I liked him or not. Whether you like him or not, he came to represent you. And the way you accept his representation is what? Being baptized and accepting him as your savior, the one who died for your atonement, the one who died for your sins. But these people who are all in political parties, they are what? They are captive to Satan's will because political parties do what? A house divided cannot stand. Imagine the world with no political parties. Do you know how much peace there would be? Instead of always looking at someone's differences to separate and create differences is the goal of Satan. So they are captive by his will. James chapter four. James chapter four, verse seven through 10. And I read, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double minded. Be afflicted, mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. And this is what I was just referring to earlier. How many people knew that this was referring to fasting? He's saying, you're going to purify your hearts by affliction. Mourn, weep, let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into heaviness. So what does that mean? On the day of atonement, you are not supposed to be relaxing like a normal day. You are supposed to be bringing complete submission into your soul and being in heaviness and saying, oh, most high, what if there wasn't a day of atonement? What would I do? What would I do without your mercy, most high? What would I do without your loving kindness, most high? What would I do without your long suffering, most high? What would I do without your patience, most high? And then in return, you say, well, that I praise you most high that you've given us this day to afflict our souls, to humble ourselves, to cleanse ourselves, to acknowledge our faults. And therefore, because you gave us this day, I am going to do from this point on Flee from the youthful desires, from the youthful lusts. I will cut off discrepancies. I will no longer have one foot trapped in Satan's bear claw. I will completely submit to you, Most High. Okay. I want to bring that word out, submit, because... <laughs> Unfortunately, many people hate this, and I'm sorry, I don't want it to sound disrespectful, but yes, many women hate this word as well, because they see the word say, submit to your husband. Okay, so a lot of people don't like this word, submit. Submit means to what? 
it means to obey. It means to be under obedience. <laughs> That's what it means. It means to be submit self unto. Now, I'm going to, for, for, and, and because just because I'm using this as uh, the word submit, and I brought this out, I'm going to say this for the sisters who are out there who, you know, have an issue with submitting. Understand that when you submit to a righteous man, okay, everything flows peacefully. Do you ever notice, and this is no disrespect, but do you ever notice that in relationships, like when people are in the world, women will submit to a very bad man. They'll get beat on, they'll get cheated on, they'll even have children and the man will commit adultery and they'll still submit to that man. Hey, they'll even give them chance after chance. They'll submit to that man. My question is, why does it become an issue when the Most High says you have to submit in righteousness? So that, and that's a part of Satan's trap as well. You have to understand the mind game Satan plays. That's Stockholm Syndrome. Why is it easy for people to submit to a captor, but not to submit to a loving father, to not to submit to a loving laws and the loving spirit of the Holy Spirit in Christ? Why is it so hard? You're not getting beat on, you're not getting cheated on, you're not getting lied to. In return, brothers, men, who are trying to enforce submission into your marriage, notice that perfect love casteth out fear. So you don't not, you don't have to force submission. It should be a what? A natural order. It should be a natural order. So if you are correct as a head under Christ, you'll naturally have your Mary and Martha, right? I don't mean to, I just mean the, the love that they show to Christ, okay? You'll naturally have that, okay? So we must submit. Don't be afraid to submit, to submit is love, okay? To submit is love, okay? You just want to make sure you're submitting to the most high because submission means love. Whether you believe it or not, people submit because they love something or someone. Okay. Moving forward. Second Corinthians chapter seven, verse 10 through 11. And I read, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold, this self same thing that ye sorrowed after, a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. In all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. So do you understand that godly sorrow works repentance? But what comes with that sorrowfulness? Okay, I will break this down to you. <laughs> all right, and what comes with, and how do you know that you are participating in godly sorrow that work in repentance it says in verse 11 for behold the self same thing that ye sorrowed after godly sorrow 
what carefulness it brought you in you. Okay, so one, you understand that godly sorrow is bringing upon carefulness, discernment, so you don't go back into the sin. So carefulness is one, okay? I'm highlighting these points for you. What? Clearing of yourselves, okay? Meaning observing, and I'm going to also bring this up as well. Clearing of yourselves, observing and an apology. Okay, it says it right there, an apology to the Most High. Okay, to give an account of oneself. Okay, to man up, to woman up and say, Most High, I made a mistake. So, clearing of selves. So, man up, woman up. What indignation? Let's go on indignation. Indignation, you can see G, G23 at the base of 43, what means much grief to be greatly afflict, afflicted, indignant, displeased. So to be displeased with yourself, okay, is godly sorrow. To be ashamed of what you've done is godly sorrow. Fear, fear, we understand what fear is. So to be fearful of the most high because you've made a mistake, fear. It says to be put in fear, alarm, or fright, to be afraid. Yeah, when you make a mistake, you that fear, that, that sorrow comes upon you because you have displeased the Most High. That's what Day of Atonement is about. Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. It says, yea, what vehement desire. Okay, vehement desire means earnest desire. It means to long for. So the Most High saying, I know that you made a mistake, but I know that you truly long for me. You truly long for the kingdom of heaven. He's looking for it. Okay, it says in the root word to yearn. It also says intensely crave possession, okay? So that would mean what? To intensely crave forgiveness, to intensely crave the kingdom of heaven. And vehement desire came with what? Zeal. What is zeal? Don't focus on the negative portion of zeal. For, focus on this one right here. Fervent mind. Fervent mind. Okay. And what is fervent? It says, and I know it says ardent, earnest, excited. Blowing as fervent. We'll go on. Burning as well. So you are in having the appearance of quality of fire. So meaning, in other words, you would be seriously working to what? <laughs> For the passion of the most high to work off those sins. Look what it says in, in three, applied to the passions and affections, passionate affection, much engaged, zealous, okay? So you are much engaged 
with the pursuit of the kingdom and forgiveness. You are showing the most high. I am serious about this. I'm sorry I broke a command. I'm sorry I made you unsat, uh, unpleased with me. I'm sorry that I put Christ to shame. Hebrew 6, I'm sorry that I made this mistake. I'm sorry that I didn't forgive my brother or my sister. I'm sorry that I held malice or envy in my heart. I'm sorry I listened to Satan and, and, and got angry at someone who didn't know any better or that I got angry in general. I'm sorry, Mosai. And it says, yea, what revenge? What? You mean revenge? I thought we're not supposed to revenge. Revenge, vindication, retribution. Okay. So there's many terms here. Vindication, revenge, the act of clearing someone or blame of blame and suspicion, or, or proof that someone or something is right, reasonable, or justified. So then you are revenging the sin in what you've done and revenging it with righteousness so that you can be justified. <laughs> Wow, right? Hmm. Wow, right? And it also means what? Retribution. So look what retribution means, repayment. So then you're saying, most high, I've committed sin. I'm going to repay you with even 10 times better then that sin. I'm going to repay you 10 times more. And that goes to, for me to add a scripture, Baruch. Chapter four, verse 28. And I read, for as it was your mind to go astray from God, so being returned, seek him 10 times more as retribution, repayment. Give him all you've got times 100. Times 100. Okay. And then Luke 15. Verse 8. Through 10 reads. Either what woman having 10 pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, do not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it. And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repented. All right, so that's going to conclude part four, brothers and sisters. We have one more part, okay? And we're going to go strictly on, and that will be strictly on Christ and how he is our atonement, okay? I want you to understand, I ended it with Luke. No matter who you are, the Most High is going to rejoice over the repentance. And now you know what godly sorrow is. 
Now you know. So I pray that this serves as a blessed lesson to help you further better yourself and humbleness to the Most High to afflict your soul so that your sins may be wiped away and that you may purify your soul so that you can get into the kingdom of heaven. With that being said, I love you all very much. Thank you for joining me for this blessed lesson of the Most High. And I pray that it served as edification on how to help you atone for your sins for the holy day and also any other time when you're fasting. Peace and blessings to you all. I love you all very much. May the Most High be with you. Shalom.